Hey everybody, welcome to the first breakdown for the new Rings of Power series. After months of dissecting images and trailers, we finally got to dive into this new Middle Earth adaptation. There's lots to cover on characters and storylines new and old, some things I really liked and some things I'm not super crazy about so far. We'll go over all of that and the deeper lore references I caught in this first episode. Now today's video is brought to you by Lord of Maps, makers of some of the most fantastic real world maps you'll ever find. Stick around after the video for more on their exciting new map book launching on Kickstarter. There was a time when the world was so young, there had not yet been a sunrise. But even then, there was light. We open with Galadriel as a child while adult Galadriel narrates. And during the time of this flashback, referred to as the Years of the Trees, the blessed realm of Valinor is lit by the light of the two trees, before the existence of the sun and moon. Galadriel's making a paper boat and argues with the other elven kids about whether it will sail, and it does, turning into a familiar shape. A swan ship that we not only see later in Lorien, but throughout the history of Middle-earth used by the elves. It turns out the other kids are kind of jerks and they destroy the boat. And Galadriel gets into a fight before it's broken up by her brother Finrod. This kid getting bullied thing is a bit of a cliche intro for Galadriel. I don't know why a young Galadriel would get bullied, but I can't say I'm surprised elf kids could be jerks. I mean, it's not like the early elves were all great role models. Speaking of a great role model, we get some moments between Finrod and Galadriel who talk about the difference between ships and stones and following the light. And as Galadriel asks how to know which light to follow, we see Finrod whisper something that won't be revealed until much later. Then Finrod mentions that he won't always be around to speak such words of wisdom to her, which I found kind of an odd statement. I can't imagine he's thinking of his impending death, considering their immortal nature. My best guess is perhaps this takes place after Morgoth's feigned rehabilitation during a time when he's planting the seeds in the hearts of the Noldor to long for realms to rule in Middle-earth. And perhaps Finrod, not wishing to be sundered from his family and friends, is already thinking he will one day leave. Or maybe it's just simply something that he foresees. Next is the absolutely jaw-dropping shot of Valinor and the Two Trees, one of my favorite shots so far in the show. Galadriel's voiceover says how the elves didn't have a word for death, and they thought their light would never dim. And then we see the two trees shriveling and dying, with the silhouette of Morgoth briefly appearing in the mist, which calls to my mind the Silmarillion quote, now Melkor, knowing that his devices had been revealed, hid himself and passed from place to place as a cloud in the hills. With Morgoth's destruction of the two trees, we're launched into a montage of a prologue sequence, which I think is trying to walk this balance of being unable to depict certain things trying not to lose casual fans, and giving imagery that appeals to book fans. There's no giant spider Ungoliant in the destruction of the two trees, which tracks with them not having Silmarillion rights. We have a shot of Tyrion that looks like a wasteland, which kind of caught me off guard because I always pictured this as more of a who turned out the lights type moment. Next, we get a shot of a circle of elves in what immediately calls to mind the Oath of Feanor. Though it's definitely not that because we see Finrod is one of those raising his sword. We'll see a handful of things like this that aren't 100% book accurate, but definitely show they're making an effort to work on the edges of their rights in order to speak to the diehards. Next, Galadriel says that a legion of elves went to war, following Morgoth to Middle-earth. Here we see ships of the elves making their way to Middle-earth and again, due to rights and simplification of the story, we don't get the kin slaying, the burning of the ships, or the crossing of the Helcaraxe. It's certainly something I'm both bummed to see so condensed, but I'm also kind of understanding that there are rights and casual audience considerations at play. We also see eagles flying with the ships of the elves. And it's here we get something that fans of this channel will not be surprised to hear I'm a big fan of, the use of maps. And you know, because I'm a map guy, I'm gonna point out the absence of Beleriand here the realm where almost everything in the first age takes place. Again, it's kind of an understandable simplification, but I would have loved to see Balerion sink into the sea on the map at the end of this sequence, because I just kind of look at this map and wonder where's all this devastation happening? Next, we have scenes of battle, 
and we have a fell beast or possibly a dragon taking down a great eagle, which I think is a nice flip from what we've previously seen in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. A quick communication that these first age battles often don't go well for the good guys. The montage we get of Finrod in battle and shots of devastation seem like they're kind of combining all the wars of the First Age into a single centuries-long conflict. And while Beleriand wasn't on the map, it does seem to pay homage to the sinking of these lands with the shots that seem like the devastation of the War of Wrath. Next we see Galadriel with the huge mound of helmets, saying that they now have many words for death. And again, while this isn't an actual depiction of it, the symbolism here is definitely meant to call to mind the Hauthen Mirnaeth, also known as the Hill of the Slain, which was a mound made of the fallen elves and men killed in the Battle of Unnumbered Tears in the First Age. Gladriel talks about Morgoth's orc spreading to every corner of Middle-earth, under the command of his most devoted servant, and we get a silhouetted shot of Sauron, who Gladriel describes as cruel, cunning, and a sorcerer. It's a description I really like because I've long said I hope they show how cunning and manipulative Sauron is, especially in the Second Age. According to Galadriel, Finrod had sworn to seek out Sauron, which is definitely not a thing from the books. Not that Finrod didn't have plenty of reason to beef with Sauron. He had taken over Finrod's first fortress in Middle-earth after all, but it hints that Finrod was on some vendetta like we see Galadriel later on, which definitely wasn't the case. Almost as if to assuage the feelings of book fans a little bit, Galadriel does say Sauron found him first, and we see big claw marks on Finrod's arm. These definitely hint at Finrod's canon death at the hands of wolves in the dungeons of Sauron's fortress. So Galadriel takes up Finrod's dagger, and his mission to hunt down Sauron. We get a look at the symbol Sauron branded into Finrod's skin, which Galadriel says even their wisest couldn't discern. So just remember folks, if it turns out to be the map of Mordor, as I theorized during the last trailer, it basically means I'm wiser than these pointy-eared elven princelings. So over the centuries, Galadriel and the elves hunted for Sauron, and we pick up with the present day where it seems Galadriel and her company are the last ones on the mission in the far northern lands of Forodwaith. Most elves have been able to move on, content that Sauron is no imminent threat. They press on and we get another shot that is very reminiscent of a different Tolkien moment. While we don't get the crossing of the Helcaraxe in the prologue, this shot is very similar to some of the most iconic artwork of it. When an elf falls from the back of the pack, Galadriel, who maybe doesn't realize what's happened, says that they keep moving. And in this moment, she's definitely coming off a bit Feanorian in her single-mindedness. The company realizes they found it, the old fortress they sought. Now again, this fortress isn't named, but it could be Morgoth's first fortress of Utumno, which was in the far north of Middle-earth, though it's kind of up in the air whether it would have survived into the Second Age. They go inside where the orcs gathered after Morgoth's defeat, and Galadriel discovers a covered passageway. And just real quick, I think this might have been a good chance to show some elven magic to breach the barrier instead of a punch. It's a small thing, but I think it would have been cooler. Inside, they find an orc sort of melted into the wall, and we're told they were meddling with the powers of the unseen world. Now, as a quick 101, everything in Tolkien's world either falls into the seen or unseen world. The seen is where the vast majority of what we see as viewers and readers happens. The unseen is inhabited by beings like wizards and elves who once lived in Valinor. So characters like Galadriel and Gandalf exist in both seen and unseen. The Ringwraiths in The Lord of the Rings also exist primarily in the unseen world, which is what Frodo sees when he puts on the ring. I think this will come back into play because I think it was Sauron experimenting with this technology to bring things from the seen to the unseen, just as the Wraiths will do later in the Second Age. Galadriel pours water on the stone slab and reveals Sauron's mark, noting how Sauron's very hand is flame unquenched. Galadriel wants to continue north, and we get some dialogue where she says how she can still see and feel the light of the trees. I like this moment because it kind of calls to mind how important this light was to the elves in those early days. The group is attacked by a snow troll, and we get a bit of action. 
and Galadriel finishes it off, and I've always felt this sword throw jump thing is a bit silly. A bit more silly than shield surfing in Lord of the Rings, but not quite as bad as stair stepper in The Hobbit. Now Galadriel's company stands up to her, putting down their swords and telling her if she wants to continue north, she'll do it alone. And at this moment, I thought it would be actually really interesting if this guy turned out to be Celeborn, since he's been calling her out on her crap so far, but we'll see that's not the case later. Real quick before we move on, it's worth noting that Galadriel says it's so evil in this place that their torches give off no warmth. And I think this will come back to play at the beginning of episode two. Map transition time and we're off to the land of the Harfoots, who it turns out live in Southern Rovanion. We see how the Harfoots live, hiding from any outsiders. Now as anyone who's been around the channel will know, I'm not a huge fan of hobbits being in the second age. While I can admit they seem pretty engaging and I didn't grimace as much as I expected, I'm still gonna be wary about how much impact they have on the larger story being told. We see the Harfoot Sadok looking through some parchment and we see a pictograph of the folks with antlers, which is followed by wolf-like images. And he's concerned that the timing of the travelers seems off. We're introduced to Nori and Poppy and they take a bunch of Hobbit kids out to some field to pick blackberries when one finds a large footprint. Nori likely realizes it's a wolf footprint so they gather up the kids and leave as we get a close-up shot of one of the creatures in question. Next we go to the elven realm of Linden and since they didn't show it on the map, I will. It's right here. This is where we find my personal favorite Tolkien character, Elrond. Mr. Half-Elven is perched in a tree writing a speech which we'll later learn is for the High King, Gilgalad. An elf maiden approaches Elrond, addressing him by his title of Herald, and informing him he won't be able to attend the council because it's limited to elf lords only. The joke's on them because Lord Elrond will one day have the most important council ever, and those lords will be dead by then, so they won't even be there. So we're definitely getting an Elrond who hasn't yet reached the level of influence we should see him achieve in this show. Turns out Galadriel is back in Linden, and Elrond rushes to meet his friend. In one of the better pieces of dialogue, we hear Galadriel and Elrond talk about what it's like to sail into the West. I kind of liked how Elrond said he expected her to arrive caked in grime, as it reminded me a bit of Elrond poking fun of Gandalf, never being properly dressed for dinner in The Hobbit. Galadriel shares the mark with Elrond, and says she wishes to go back out on her quest. And here's where I totally winced when she calls Elrond a politician. I'm sure it's not meant to have the same connotation as in the real world, but man, do I not like using the phrase for Elrond. Galadriel demands an audience with the king, and Elrond says she can have it after the ceremony if she wishes. Then we're back to Harfoots doing hobbity things, and the main takeaway is Nori is adventuresome, unlike the others, which no doubt feels very similar to the way Bilbo and Frodo are described and behave. Then we're right back at the elven ceremony where High King Gilgalad is reciting the speech Elrond wrote. And the big twist here is that Gilgalad is granting the company the honor of sailing west to Valinor. This seemed pretty odd to me that the king would grant this rather than it being up to the elves themselves. We next see Galadriel in a forest where the images of fallen elves are carved into living trees. And while the obvious one is Finrod, the one to the left looks to be holding the dragon helm of Dor Lomin, most notably worn by Turin Turambar in the Children of Hurin story. But since these are all elves, my guess is this is Fingon, who gave the dragon helm to the men of Dor Lomin. While it's not the latest word on the topic, Fingon is the father of Gilgalad. We get glimpses of others, and while I'm not certain on all of them, this most definitely is Luthien along with the great hound, Huon. Elrond and Galadriel strike up a conversation, and it's probably the highlight of the episode for me because of the deeper meaning and the way I think these characters are being set up as really important to each other, becoming who they need to become. Galadriel says, you haven't seen what I have seen, and Elrond says, I've seen my share, followed by Galadriel repeating her line. Galadriel saw the two trees destroyed, and while it's not in here, all three of her brothers die because of Morgoth. Meanwhile, Elrond has been a victim of elf against elf kinslaying and separated from his parents since a young age. Galadriel doesn't want to leave because all the horrors of her past would be left alive inside her. Elrond then points out that it's only in the blessed realm that she could be fully healed. 
and he vows to take up the cause himself should her fears come to fruition. And I like that Elrond doesn't back down from Galadriel in this scene. He knows what she needs to hear and shows the wisdom I hope to see in the character. And when Galadriel asks who she is without her sword, I think this will be her arc for a good chunk of the series. The Galadriel we're getting in this show is not the Galadriel of the Third Age, and she's gonna have to learn how to become that person. And I think Elrond will be a big part of that journey. Next, we see the Southlands, which actually seem to be in a different position than in the featurette. Here it seems to be more east than south within Mordor. And here's where we're introduced to Arondir. And while I've been pretty lukewarm overall on original characters, I gotta say I like this more stoic elf. I think while he'll no doubt be doing cool elven acrobatics like Legolas in good time, his stoicism will be a nice difference between the two characters. He and one of the Southrons talk about a poison patch of grass when one of the patrons gets all bent out of shape. Turns out the elves have been watching over these people for a thousand years since Morgoth's defeat because their ancestors sided with the Dark Lord in the First Age. And the kid here says one day their king will return and free them from the elves. I'm really curious who he might be talking about here. Is he referring to a man or is he so bold as to be thinking of Morgoth or Sauron? Next, we see Arondir and Bronwyn who gives him Alfarin seeds. Now, Alfarin is another name for the symbol Muna, which you'll recognize as the flower that grows on the graves we see in Rohan during the Third Age. Now, these two are obviously sweet on each other and Arondir's fellow elf gives him a hard time about it, pointing out that there's only ever been two man-elf pairings attempted and each ending in tragedy and death. The previous two being Baron and Luthien and Tuor and Idril. Aragorn and Arwen would become the third such pairing much later. I could see this story playing out similarly to the story of Galadriel's brother Agnor and his love for the mortal Andreth, where they were in love but never married, and I could see these characters having a similarly tragic end. We get news that the High King has declared the Watchtowers are no longer needed, and Arondir has a conversation with the Watchwarden, who says they've not watched over the people of Tirharad because of what their ancestors once did, but because of who they still are. In the next scene, while Arondir's at Bronwyn's house, a man brings a sick cow which produces a black ooze instead of milk. I have no idea what's going on here, but I'd venture to say the cow isn't in great shape. But there's no Skywalkers coming along to drink it, so Arondir and Bronwyn head to the next town over to investigate. Theo brings the kid from the pub to their barn where he shows him the black sword shard. The kid mentions Theo's dad leaving, which makes me wonder if that could be someone we meet in episode two. And of course, we do see that the sword has Sauron's mark on it. Galadriel passes beyond Elrond's sight in a callback to Gandalf's same line about Frodo in The Return of the King. And Elrond and Gil-galad talk about how it was best for Galadriel and Middle-earth for her to sail west. While Elrond is torn and perhaps second-guessing himself, Gil-galad hints that they foresaw that she could cause the very thing she wished to prevent. And speaking of causing bad things to happen, we're then introduced to Celebrimbor, Lord of Eregion, who will eventually forge the Rings of Power. Gil-galad wants Elrond to help Celebrimbor on a mission of the utmost importance. And I think what they're seeking to do is find a way to preserve their elven realms. For while the elves linger, the world continues to grow old, as the elves want their realms to last and be beautiful like Valinor. Sadok says the skies are strange and we're back to Arondir and Bronwyn who discover the village on fire and destroyed. Then we're back with Galadriel and the elves sailing west. And I just thought of this, but I guess these ceremonial disrober people also get to sail west and they didn't have to face any trolls, so lucky them, I guess. The clouds part and we get a blinding radiant light. And I actually really like how this scene plays out as the elves are bathed in light and we get an ethereal chorus. Intercut is the meteor making its way across the lands and based on where Gil-galad is standing, in relation to the ceremony earlier, it sure looks like this is coming from the west, possibly flying over Fangorn Forest as we see some Ents and finally landing in Southern Rovanion near the Harfoots. Galadriel is torn about her decision, and Finrod's earlier words of not knowing which light to follow until you've touched the darkness return to her. She then jumps ship, 
rejecting the call to sail into the west. Gilgalad notices a fallen leaf, which has black veins appearing on it, and we get kind of an outer shadow effect, which makes me wonder if this is some kind of vision of the High King. Either way, it's probably not a great sign. Nori walks up on the wreckage to find Meteor Man in the midst of the fire, and we cut to black. One hour down, 49 to go. So overall, I don't think this was the stronger of the first two episodes. It felt like there were a lot of things crammed into that first half. And actually on rewatch, I found myself enjoying the pacing better around the time of Galadriel and Elrond's conversation in the forest. While it's not a start that hooks me the same way Fellowship did all those years ago, I think it's plenty strong enough to be getting on with and certainly shows a lot of promise moving forward into episode two, for which I'll be releasing a separate breakdown video, hopefully later today. Now, while you're waiting for that breakdown, check out Lord of Maps' new coffee table book project that just launched on Kickstarter. The book will feature over 70 maps, including all 50 states and two dozen extras. Be sure to also check them out at lordofmaps.com to get a print of one of their wonderful maps for your home or for a gift for the map-loving fan in your life. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Kella Brimbor, The Mighty Mim, Team Weasel, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, Toby Mobs Music, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Salim Rahman, Zetrock, Berto Berg, Grand Strategy Nerd, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description and purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.